while we're waiting. Um, come on, come on. I just wanted to say, uh, this has been a pretty exciting year for Rust, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the technical stuff, but you know, just looking alone at the set of conferences, so we had last year, we had Rust Camp. This year we had Rust Conf, Rust Fest in Berlin, and now we have Rust Belt Rust. So I'm pretty excited about that, and I want to thank you guys for coming, and thanks to all the organizers and the sponsors for making this happen. So I'm just going to do this myself. synchronize or something. Okay, all right. So, we're going to talk this uh, we're going to talk mostly about Rust in 2017, but I want to start by looking a little bit about what's happened in 2016 or really since about May 2015, which was Rust 1.0. Right? And if you remember, think back, uh, at that time we kind of just announced that we were going to be stable, and we had a pretty small, but you know, solid and respectable API surface available. But in the meantime, the standard library has really fleshed out, and we've gotten over 175 new features, probably more, this is, and also a much bigger Crates IO ecosystem and so forth. And so you can do a lot more with stable Rust now than you could then. And we've also had a lot of exciting language features that are been implemented and worked out and spec uh, specced and are now coming kind of starting to become available and stable right about now. So specialization and infiltrate are available on nightly. Uh, the question mark operator was just specialized. I think it'll be in the next release, if not the one after that. And we're going to soon have custom derives so you can do things like derive, uh, use Serde on stable and so forth, which has been a really popular uh, big feature request. We've also done a lot of work re-architecting the compiler, laying the groundwork for some of the stuff that we're going to talk about now uh, for 2017. So we've done a completely new IR, which was a big effort, uh, and especially kind of a big community effort, which was really exciting. And that allowed us to do some long-standing optimizations to our code generation. Incremental compilation is starting to work. Hopefully in the next few months, we'll have it really uh, in use uh, for, the first, for the first time. And also, we have a brand new error message output, which I think many of you have experienced, uh, that makes the errors much easier to, to follow and so forth. And finally, we're now working much more stably on much more platforms, right? So Windows support is much better. You can target Musil, which lets you deploy your binaries to any Linux ever or whatever, something like that. And, uh, and then you have Rust up to easily switch between them, right? So that's really cool. But moreover, we've done all these things without totally messing up Rust. Uh, it turns out people still really like it. Uh, we hope to keep that up. So we're pretty proud of the fact that, you know, we came in top on this survey with 79% of people who use Rust still want to use Rust. Uh, and that's basically the kind of numbers we like to see. But not only do we have people who are surveyed, but we've also had a lot of adoption coming out of industry as well. So this is a little video of our friends page as of a little while back, and I'm kind of awkwardly scrolling through it. Uh, I'd like to know how to do this better. Someone should really talk to me about it. <laughs> but there you go. Um, and I think there were 35 or 36 companies there at the time. And now, uh, finally, there's also just been an explosion in meetups and conferences, as I already mentioned. So we have something like 80 meetups around the world with thousands and thousands of members uh, which are meeting regularly. So very cool. And I'm going to hand it over to Aaron now to talk about 2017. <laughs> Thanks, Nico. Um, yeah, and I just I want to say in terms of other things that we've managed to not mess up, I think one of the most exciting aspects is the Rust community. Um, so we heard with the opening yesterday about the importance of being welcoming. And I think as the community has grown, I've been extremely encouraged to see that it's keeping all of these values central, which is pretty amazing. So keep up the good work. Um, OK, but now time for some prognostication. Um, so everybody's eager to hear you know, what are our plans uh, for the next year. And one of the nice things about doing development in the open, as we do with Rust, uh, is that we get to talk about this all as a community and actually chart out a course together. So we don't, in fact, need a crystal ball to figure out where Rust is headed. Uh, we're going to do it together. <clears throat> so if you've been following Rust uh, in development in the last couple months, you might have heard about a new process that we're rolling out starting in 2017. 
which is to actually have a formal roadmap for the language. Right? So the idea is every year we will go through this exercise as a community, we'll gather data uh, to sort of figure out where the key problems are, uh, what kinds of things we want to solve with the language that year, and then we'll work together to come up with some basic goals, uh, things that we want to achieve as a community in that year. Um, so in terms of uh, you know, discovering problems, uh, we have a few different ways of gathering that data. So we sent out uh, a survey, which I'll talk about uh, a bit later. We've also, the community team has been reaching out to companies that are using Rust or want to use Rust to figure out where their problems are, where they'd like to see Rust grow. Um, and of course, we just have you know, conversations amongst ourselves as, as a community um, as we're doing outreach and so on. So once we've got these problems laid out that we want to solve, then we need to execute. And so the idea is going to be that every six weeks, which is synchronized with our release cycle, the various Rust teams will sort of do a sprint. Uh, so the layout in this six weeks, what are we going to do to move the ball forward on uh, these yearly goals that we've laid out? Right. And this is really exciting because I think I, I've heard from a lot of people, you know, there's so much going on in Rust. It's really hard to tell, you know, to sort of keep on top of it and to tell what is the most important stuff. Right. So these yearly goals are the most important things we're targeting. But then these six week sprints give you a sense for, you know, if I want to get involved as a volunteer, where do I go? How can I actually help out with these efforts? So all of that will be surfaced probably in GitHub, some easy to find way. Um, and that, that'll be starting in 2017. And then fi the final piece of this, um, which I think is really important, is we want to tell this story to the broader world, right? So you know, if we as a community have a hard time following everything that's happening in Rust, you know, the people outside of this community have an even harder time let's, you know, following the story of Rust. So the idea here is at the end of the year, you know, when we finish this process, we put together a big retrospective that says, as a community, you know, what did we do? What was the story of Rust this year? How did it evolve? What is the state of our ecosystem? How do you dive into Rust? And so you know, on yearly increments, the world gets to hear about Rust's evolution in a very clear way. So I'm really excited about this process. Um, and we've already started taking a number of steps toward it. OK, so with that overview, let me dive into a little bit more of the specifics. Um, so I mentioned uh, you know, that we uh, sent out a survey um, and got actually tremendous response to it, more than I think any of us anticipated. So we had over 3,000 respondents to the survey. And this survey was targeted at both people who currently use Rust, have used Rust in the past but are no longer using it, or people who've never used Rust, right? We were interested to hear from all of those different camps. So the, the chart at the bottom you know, shows basically people, the breakdown of people actively using Rust versus not. So about a third of the respondents are not using Rust, which is great. That that's, gives us a lot of insight into what it's going to take to grow Rust's adoption. You know, what are the blockers to people actually picking it up? OK, so what, what did we hear out of this survey? So we got a number of challenges. Um, by far, the clearest cut one is that Rust has a steep learning curve. I don't think this comes as a surprise to anybody in this room. That's definitely you know, part of the, the meme around Rust right now. And the feeling generally is it's worth it. Right? You get through those couple of weeks fighting the borrow checker, it's hard, but then once you're over that hump, it's worth it. Right? But how many people do we end up losing in those first couple of weeks? Right? Can we fix this? Okay. Uh, so that, that one in four respondents talk about the learning curve. Uh, again, unsurprisingly, given how early we are in the language development, a lot of people are talking about Rust doesn't have enough libraries, it's not covering my needs. Right? So, this is, this is expected, but it's, it's good to see it uh, sort of quantitatively showing up in the survey. And then on a similar note, a lot of people talked about just the general maturity of the language, the tooling, and so on, um, wanting Rust to be more mature before they felt comfortable trying to use it in production, for example. OK, next one came as, I think, a surprise to many of the core developers, since we're all Emacs users, at least <laughs> the proper ones. Uh, um, but it turns out a lot of people love IDEs. A lot of people uh, depend on IDEs for their core workflow. A lot of companies basically across the board use IDEs. And so for many people, it's just a total non-starter to say, pick up this language that doesn't have a good IDE experience. Um, and so there, you know, that was mentioned in 1 in 19 respondents overall. But I think most importantly, if you look at that you know, third chunk 
of uh, people who aren't actually using Rust today. One in four cited IDEs as an important reason. Right, so this is, this is a huge challenge. And then everybody knows the compiler uh, could be a little faster, and this is especially important as you do try to use Rust in production. It's the number one complaint we hear from all of our production users. So I don't think any of these challenges come as a great surprise, um, but I think there are some interesting themes here, right? So if you, you know, are like Nico or me, you're, you know, sort of, uh, bred to do language design, right? We come from this academic background, and so we're eager to like build more language features and make the language richer and so on. It's very tempting to focus on that stuff, but really none of these challenges are about making the language nicer, you know, from a like academic design perspective. What they're really all about is productivity. People want to, people see the potential value in Rust, but they're worried about being productive with it. They're worried about learning it quickly. They're worrying, worried about you know, mature libraries that have their back or IDEs that make, make them productive. Right? So there are a lot of different ways to think about productivity. Right? So here I just have a few different questions that are related to productivity. And you know, I don't want to say that Rust is completely unproductive. I mean, some of these things we actually do really well. Right? So <laughs> if you want to write correct code, Rust is a very productive way to do that compared to a lot of other languages, right? Because it, the compiler has your back across, you know, so many different issues. The standard library is built very carefully to guide you to the, the right kinds of patterns, right? Similarly, if you want to write code that's fast, Rust is a much more productive way to do that than many other languages. Okay, so, so we get some of that right, but then some of these other questions don't really sound like Rust today, right? How quickly can I start writing real code? Well, there's that learning curve with the borrow checker that we all sort of are familiar with. Um, if you're you know, at a company that wants to start spinning up use of Rust, how long is it gonna take you to train up a team, right? Can you use Rust to prototype? Does that make sense? Right, so I think these are really important questions for driving Rust adoption. And I think it's tempting to imagine that Rust is just inherently going to be bad at these things compared to some of the, the others, right? Because Rust has this emphasis on safety, on reliability, on performance, and so it's easy to think that, well, those things fundamentally come at a cost, right? That it's gonna be harder, it's gonna be slower, um, right? So you might think that this is, this is just an inherent trade-off. But I wanna tell you something about trade-offs, right? So, so here's a slide from uh, last year's Rust camp where we tried to really articulate what Rust 1.0 represented, what were the, some of the core ideas behind Rust. And the theme here, each and every one of these lines is talking about what seems to be a fundamental trade-off that Rust overcomes, right? So you might think that if you want safety in a language, you have to have a garbage collector. Rust says, no, actually, you can have both at the same time. Um, you might think that if you wanna do concurrent programming, you're gonna have to cope with data races. And Rust says, no, actually, we can do both at the same time, right? And so the overall message is that as a community, we're actually really good at rethinking these trade-offs, at overcoming them. We know how to have our cake and eat it too. And so I think the challenge of this year for Rust is to start thinking about productivity as a core value of Rust that's on the same level as speed and reliability, right? So I want, personally, at the end of 2017, to be able to claim this as a slogan that really applies to Rust. And I think we're well positioned to start overcoming some of these trade-offs. So with that said, if the rest of this talk, what we're gonna do is look at each of the areas of development in Rust, each of the sort of teams um, within Rust, and think about how those teams can con contribute basically to the push toward productivity in Rust. So starting with the language. All right, so let's see. So we want to talk about what changes should we think about for the language uh, in order to really focus on productivity. And as, as Aaron said, I think a lot of times when we think about the language, we think about major new features, but there might be some kind of different ways we can look at it, different places we can tweak. Right? And if we look, what does Rust do really well today? Uh, there is a lot that we do great. Right? And I think you can say, what do people really like using about Rust? In terms of what I like using about Rust is this sort of feeling I get of like galactic power, right? I can just 
throw out a few lines and I'm like a magician. I just kind of say what I want and I get not only is the code kind of pretty and does what I want it to say pretty uh, concise, but it also actually executes really fast. I don't have to go rewrite it later to, to do it the fast way or, or something like that. Right? So I can write an iterator that finds the longest line and, uh, and it works. I can make that iterator run in parallel using Rayon, which I'll talk about later. Um, or, you know, using some of this upcoming futures in Tokyo uh, work, I could f send RPC requests to servers and get responses and have all of that be uh, handled both simply but also efficiently, right? And if we look at this chart, you can kind of see what I mean by efficiently. This comes from, uh, I think it was Aaron's blog post, right? Aaron and Alex's blog post a while back, measuring the performance of hello world requests on a server. So kind of a baseline performance. How many requests can you process per second? And we see that Rust comes in here, right? The biggest bar. But if you think back to before there was Rust and you were to say, here's a chart of different servers. And I can tell you that one of them is implemented in the language with the strongest safety guarantees using abstractions all the way down uh, to the, as far down as we could get them, kind of in the most idiomatic style. You probably wouldn't have guessed, oh, it must be the fastest one. You would have thought, oh, that's the one down there. That's the slow one. Um, but it's not the case, right? We turned that, that trade off and just kind of made it go away. Uh, and I think that that emphasis on things being reliable and fast, you can see it even in small fragments of Rust code. And it's really nice. Right? So here's a little bit of Rust code, a uh, kind of simplistic one. It takes a name and prints it out and says, greets the user by name. Right? But even here, you see that, OK, Maybe the user has declined to provide a name, or we don't have one. So to represent that, we use an option type instead of like a null pointer. And that means that when we match on it, we have to remember to handle this case. That's nice. Um, so now we will not f uh, just uh, throw an exception or something, right? And we also have uh, up here, we see that this is actually a reference to an option, which is part of the ownership and borrowing system that lets us have data race freedom and lets us have uh, not needing to use the garbage collector to get safety. So this is really cool, and I could submit this code to the compiler and run it, but I'm going to have a slight problem. Right, there's this, this error, and it's, it's a little bit irritating, <laughs> but it's, it's OK. We're experienced Rust users. Uh, mismatch types, I know what to do. The problem is, right here, I was matching on a name and treating it like it's an option, but it's actually a reference to an option, so I need a star so that I can match on what the reference refers to. Right? No problem, I'm going to compile it now. And now it's going to work, except there's another problem. OK, that's a little annoying. <laughs> but I, I know what it is. I can't move out of borrowed content. The problem is here. Uh, when I say sum of n, I'm taking ownership of the string that's inside the option. But I've only borrowed this option. And I can't take ownership of something I borrowed. So I have to put ref uh, to kind of tell the compiler, no, I want to borrow the string that's inside the option. And now my code is going to work. right? And this is something that probably every experienced Rust programmer has experienced on a daily basis. Um, and it's not that big a deal when you kind of know the rules, or it can feel like it's not that big a deal. But if you're coming new to Rust, it's a whole other story, right? <laughs> uh, this is like possibly enough to say, I can't even print a string on the screen with this language. That's it. I'm, I'm going to go, whatever, code in something else, right? And that's kind of what we'd like to change. But the interesting thing about this is that if we can improve this, and do it in the right way, it's going to benefit everyone, right? Because even the experienced users also encounter this. We've just kind of learned to move past it. Um, there are a bunch of examples that kind of fit in this mold, right? One that, that comes up a lot is handling how we handle string literals, uh, which is a very kind of accurate way to model how they work. But in particular, there are two string types, right? A string literal is statically allocated in the binary, so it has a different type because it doesn't need to be freed. It's an ampersand stir versus capital string, which represents a heap allocated string buffer. But the problem, the end effect is, when I write a little hello world program like this, you know, I get this error right away, and it has a lot of kind of confusing components to it, and it might be enough to turn people off. And I know that when I do tutorials, this is literally the first thing I do, right? Is I say, let's talk about hello world so that we can all get past the string thing and, and go on. Um, and that's a little unfortunate. Um, and there's another example that comes up a lot which has to do with the borrowing system. Right, so here I have a mutable reference to a map, and I'm looking up a key in it, and I'm doing something with this key. And so long as I'm in this branch, where I found uh, the, the value in the map, I have a reference into the map, the compiler's going to prevent me from trying to mutate the map, like insert new keys. And that's a good thing, because if I did that, I'd probably crash my program. 
Um, and that kind of makes sense. It's borrowed. When it's borrowed, I can't mutate it. However, on this other branch, where there was nothing in the map, um, I also can't mutate the map, right? And you get an error like this one. And the problem here is not that there's a fundamental thing, it's that the compiler is kind of over approximating. It's not smart enough to realize, oh, on this branch, there actually isn't any, the map isn't really borrowed. Now, this is sort of interesting because this constraint led us to some really cool APIs like entry. So I'm sort of happy it was there, but I think it's time for it to go. Um, <laughs> and a lot of the refactoring that we've done will make that possible. Um, so these little things, they kind of add up, right? And there's a list. This is some things I've heard about. I'd like to hear about other things. And in all of these cases, I want to emphasize, it's not that we just sort of mm, didn't think about it or we made it hard on purpose or I don't know what, but there's a real technical trade-off involved, right? And it seems like there's like this tug of war between can we get precision and explicitness so that you don't make mistakes uh, or can we make it easy but then maybe it's going to be slow. And so what we need to do when we think about these is not just say, oh, let's paper over it with some, have the compiler or insert a bunch of coercions that are going to allocate memory everywhere and kind of turn it into lose some of the great things about Rust, we need to find ways to preserve those things and solve these dilemmas, right? Figure out where is it most important to keep the explicitness and where can we let it go? Um, and then we'll have like this happy dog running down this beach. And so if we look, there are a bunch of examples where we've done this successfully, I think, in the language. And one of my favorites is the closure design. Uh, and that's partly because it was the first thing I worked on in Rust five years ago, and I'm still working on it, uh, or was until about a year ago, and now we're kind of done. That's a nice feeling. Uh, and it worked out pretty well, right? So closures are like this fundamental building block. If you look here, every one of these examples I gave you involved a closure somewhere, right? And sometimes more than one. And there's actually a pretty sophisticated model behind the scenes, because closures have to accommodate all these use cases. They have to work for sequential iterators, parallel iterators, which have different constraints, because you have to prevent data races, also work for futures, which are again a different thing, because you're kind of rolling up your stack frames and moving things into the heap. And accommodating all of this with one abstraction took us a while. Um, and I think we did a really good job, because using it feels very natural. You sort of aren't aware of all the complexities necessarily when you just use these APIs. Uh, so for example here, when I use a variable in a closure that comes from my surrounding environment, the compiler actually has to decide, am I gonna, is that going to be a borrow, a mutable borrow, or is it taking ownership of this variable? And the way it does that is by looking at how the variable is used. Right? So we can see, well, if you're going to call write string, write string is going to need ownership of my socket. That implies then that the closure must own my socket so that it can kind of thread the ownership through. And that, that just winds up feeling very natural. You didn't have to write any annotations, but you haven't actually removed explicitness from the program. Right? You just didn't have to repeat yourself, essentially. The information was already there. And I think we can apply similar principles to a lot of these examples, right? So in terms of this match example, you could imagine that we automatically skip past references because there's really nothing else you can do but dereference them when you match on them. And then if we encounter this, this variable n, we can see how is it used and make the decision then, is it going to be a reference or not? Um, so here we would just be printing it so we don't need ownership. Similarly, we can make the capital string type uh, potentially able to handle and understand the data might live, might not need to be freed, and then we can support coercions um, and just have this code work, right? And similarly down here, we're, we're already well underway here, but we can make the compiler better able to understand control flow so that we can do inserts and so on. And if we do this, each of these little things may not be that big a deal, but the end feeling will be that the language feels very different overall. Right? And the, the feeling of productivity, I think, will be substantially increased. And not just the feeling, I guess, but also the reality of it. Uh, and so that's my, my kind of overarching goal here, is not necessarily any one of these changes, but the idea that when we think about language changes, let's not only think about how we can extend the language to do new things, but how we can do all the things we do now better and easier and more productively. All right. Now, Aaron. Cool. Thanks, Nico. OK. Um, so what about libraries? Um, what does it mean for Rust libraries to be productive? So I think uh, taking a very broad view, um, it's pretty simple, right? We need libraries for sort of common tasks that come up a lot to exist. They have to be out there somewhere. They should be findable, right? You, you should be able to search for them and, and easily find your way through crates.io or some other way. Um, and those libraries should be of high quality, 
right? If, if you're going to be productive, you need those libraries to actually work well. And of course, I'm thinking of quality here in the same terms as what we were seeing before, so fast, reliable, and productive. So that's a fairly simple overarching goal, um, but what does it mean as a community to sort of focus on these three improvements? Um, so first of all, let's talk about actually building libraries, right? So I think uh, people generally know that Rust's standard library has taken a minimalistic approach for a lot of reasons, right? So it's not really a batteries included uh, style of a standard library, and that's okay because we have uh, great tooling with Cargo and Crates I.O., so it's very easy to pull in lots of external libraries. But those batteries, even if they're not included in the standard library, they do need to exist somewhere, right? So the first thing I think we need to do as a community is figure out where the key gaps are, and we can use things like the survey data, um, or we can go look at you know, other languages and sort of take the cross-section of their batteries included standard libraries and so on. Um, so here are just a few ideas, I think, for some of the most obvious targets for this year. Um, so Rust on the server has sort of already come up with, with Tokyo and Futures. That work is well underway. Uh, I think that's going to be really important for production uses of Rust. Uh, but there's more work we can do on Rust concurrency story, really bringing it to fruition, um, as well as a number of other areas. Right, so I think the, uh, the library team can sort of act as a coordinator between different sub-communities working on these different areas and, and try to pull everybody together to, uh, to really you know, land 1.0 level libraries in a lot of these areas. Uh, okay, so, so that would be sort of the first bullet, actually making sure that libraries exist. What about finding them? Um, so library discoverability is a little bit tricky because you want it to be easy to find the best libraries for a given task, but defining what best means is obviously pretty subjective, and there's a risk that you lock in sort of first movers, like the earliest library, uh, be becomes the one that the search site gives you on the top and you sort of just reinforce its status even though better libraries are coming down the pike, right? So defining what it means to be best and, and coming up with good metrics for search is really hard, but I think it's really important uh, for people to be able to find these high quality libraries easily. So one thing we, we've been taking um, as some potential inspiration here is the Ember ecosystem. So there's a site called Ember Observer that has very carefully set up a bunch of metrics, some objective things like you know downloads or GitHub stars, um, and then some more subjective things like actual uh, curated reviews of libraries. So I think we could do something similar to this within Crates.io. Um, similarly, there's actually been work in the Rust ecosystem to categorize libraries uh, into different domains, and I think we could put that together with a ranking system to make it much easier to find libraries for a given task. What about quality? Uh, so I think there are some steps we can take to improve quality across the board. You may have seen the DocsRS website that already came out, um, which automatically provides documentation in a central place for everything on Crates.io. This has been amazing for the ecosystem, um, but there's more work we can do to improve the documentation experience. Another thing we can do is uh, um, make it easier for projects to set up CI, for example, as part of Cargo New, um, or provide more elaborate testing frameworks. So right now, uh, we have some built-in testing and benchmarking uh, in the rest, uh, in, in Cargo, um, but it's unstable and you can't actually build out new testing frameworks. So we'd like to improve that as well. Um, and then finally, we're, we're looking at some uh, sort of efforts to figure out how best to write unsafe code, which is really crucial for these lower level libraries that are sort of the foundations of the ecosystem. Um, so giving guidelines to libraries, authors as to how to do this correctly is, is gonna be hugely important. All right, so um, sort of being aware of time, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit quicker here. So that, that was sort of the library story. I think there's, it's, it's a big space, there's a lot we can do. Um, but tooling is also extremely important. And I think there's a lot to say about the tooling story. Um, but for today, we're gonna focus on that most important bullet we saw from, from the challenges, which is uh, the IDE experience. So Rust has made some progress on this front over the last year. Um, probably a lot of you are familiar with or have used Racer, uh, which is you know, a tool that can do things like autocomplete in a number of editors. Racer's really cool. Um, it's very fast, but it works totally independently of the compiler, right? So this is based on 
heuristics and its own you know, means of, of parsing out the programs that you're writing. Um, and, but yeah, but it covers autocomplete. It, it coexists with uh, lots of existing uh, editors uh, like Emacs and Vim and so on. There's also uh, a rapidly maturing plugin for IntelliJ, which takes a similar approach. So IntelliJ, in general, has a, a very rich toolkit for building up IDEs around languages, but they're also sort of building their own compiler, in, in a sense, right? Um, so that, that allows them to get up to speed very quickly, but I think in both cases, you're somewhat limited in what you can do in terms of getting very precise information out of the Rust compiler. So one of the things we're interested in exploring is uh, a strategy that allows us to bring the compiler into the picture, right? So the idea, the idea here is um, we have some IDE or editor sitting out there that's talking via some protocol to a central language service, the Rust language service. And that Rust language service is uh, you know, just a, a process running in the background that sort of knows something about your code and is keeping things up to date and can answer questions from the IDEs. And then that language service uh, on the back end might be talking to things like Racer to get answers quickly, or it might be talking to the compiler to get things uh, more precise. So you know, I think the best way to explain this is to actually show it to you in action. Um, so actually this tool recently hit alpha. Um, Jonathan and Nick have been working on it a lot, so Jonathan's gonna come up and, and show you what it can do today. Instead of time, because I know I think we're already over time. <coughs> so, and this pops up. So this is uh, it's not even alpha yet. This is pre-alpha uh, at RustConf. Just out quickly. How many how many people went to RustConf? Okay, so not that many. That's great. So this is first time that a lot of you may have seen this uh, at RustConf. We showed a demo of what this would be like. This is the actual RLS running now. Uh, so I can hover, and when I hover, I get type information. This is again getting fed because we're we got racer and we have the compiler giving us these data sources and we can mix them together. Uh, if we mistype something, it comes back and says that's an error. And if I hover the error, it gives me what the error is. And uh, because it's pre-alpha, we get all kinds of like little warnings, but don't worry about that. Um, we can do you know I can find all references. I can see all the places uh, that this thing is defined and used. And if I have all of those locations, that's awesome. We can also do things like renaming. We have perfect knowledge. So if I wanted to call this position instead, you see all the position, cause became position, but notice it's not textual. So POS still saved the same. So we know exactly where that symbol is being used. Uh, and let me quickly, again, I know cognizant of time, but I just wanna show this real quick. Uh, this is the cool power of open source. So we did the RLS it worked on our laptops and we kind of put it out in the world and then let other people start banging on it. And they've already ported it to Windows and have it working in Windows. So this is the same experience uh, that you have in the Linux and OS X world, but now ported so it works in Windows. Thanks. This is the most important part of the talk because this beautiful image is actually a fungus, and it's the rust fungus, which <laughs> I think is a wonderful thing. I didn't realize how, it, how kind of attractive it would be when I went looking for it. So <laughs> there are a bunch of other teams and a lot of other efforts. We focused on the, the, the language, the libraries, and the IDEs, sort of technical side, but there's a lot of other things, right? We need one really important way to bring people up to speed is to focus on documentation and helping them learn uh, in this side and similarly so the docs team is working on a kind of new approach to the book after having had some more experience with how people learn Rust best and then we have the community team kind of collecting learning materials working on Rust Bridge which I think we heard mentioned a number of times earlier um, and that's some in progress and of course the compiler team is trying to make all these technical things come to be uh, and make it go faster and have fewer bugs always a good thing so with that I'm gonna leave you um, just remember the slogan, fast, reliable, productive, pick three. So thank you guys very much.